Hi there, my name is Noah, and I'm going to be your guest lecturer today. Luckily for you and I, we are going to do a deep dive into how developmental processes are positioned on the anterior, posterior, and dorsal ventral axes. Let's dive right in. Pretend that you're at a concert. There are a ton of people at the front near the stage, and as you get further and further from the stage, there are less and less people. Depending on what you want your experience to be like, there is an optimal spot in the crowd where you can achieve the perfect ratio of the proximity to the stage to how tight the space around you is. The crowd is essentially a gradient that changes the experience of someone in it depending on where they are within it. Molecular gradients in biological systems, especially in developmental neurobiology, achieve a very similar result. The gradient provides a continuous spectrum of very specific positions, and this concept is used greatly in the formation of the components of the dorsal, ventral, and anterior, posterior axes. As a quick reminder of what these terms mean, let me lie down real quick. The anterior side of me is towards my head, while the posterior is towards my feet. And the dorsal side of me is on my backside, while the ventral side of me is on my front side. Okay, now that we have covered all of our important context, let's see how the gradients come into play. Gradients early on in development play a pr crucial role in the anterior-posterior axis component positioning and formation. Once the spumin organizer forms, gradients involving BMP, nodal, and wind proteins form. One specific area has a high concentration of BMP and nodal, while another has a high concentration of nodal and wind. As the mesoderm gets pulled underneath the ectoderm by the organizer, this gradient shifts, resulting in an area that has a high concentration of all three, an area with a low concentration of all three, and an area with only a high concentration of nodal. Each of these three areas will create what will be very specific sections of the anterior-posterior axis. The one with all, high, all three in high concentrations will result in the tail. The one with none of all three in high concentrations will result in the brain. And the one with only a high concentration of nodal will derive the main spinal cord. The relationships between these concentration areas and the resulting position along the anterior-posterior axis was helped by studies such as Bauermeister's in 1996, where they discovered a protein called Cerberus that attached to all three of nodal, wind, and BMP. This, program, this protein, which injected, when injected into a different part of the embryo, ended up creating an additional ectopic head on the resulting embryo showing that taking all three of these proteins out of the system will create an additional head. Gradients became involved again during the creation of somites along the axis. These gradients involve a familiar protein, wind. Somites develop from the anterior to the posterior, and the newest somite forms along what is known as the determination wavefront, which aligns with where the fading concentrations of wind and retinoic acid reach each other. These somites end up forming the key segmented components along the central nervous system, again proving the importance of gradients in the formation and position of the anterior-posterior axis. Do gradients play a part in the formation of the anterior-posterior axis in invertebrates as well? The answer is yes. Although invertebrates do not develop a neural tube that zips shut along the already defined axis as vertebrates do, the formation of the anterior-posterior axis forms simultaneously with the segmentation of the body into specific fates such as the head, thorax, and abdomen. This segmentation and axis formation is largely due to the role of the protein called hunchback, which has high concentrations on what will be the anterior side of the embryo. Just like we saw in vertebrates, however, hunchback's gradient is not the only contributor to this occurrence. There are two regulator transcription factors, bicoid and nanos, that help both induce and inhibit the concentration of hunchback and its posterior competition, caudal. Bicoid has a high concentration towards the anterior and works to promote hunchback while also inhibiting caudal. Nanos is highly concentrated on the posterior side of the embryo and directly inhibits hunchback. All four of these gradients and the checks and balances they produce force a very clear divide between the posterior and anterior sides of the embryo, and any faults in these result in a mutated organism. For example, a bicoid mutation that inhibits its functionality causes no head to form an embryo, so their interactions are key to the formation and positioning of the anterior and posterior axis. Do all of the key ideas about gradients that we discussed so far hold when looking at the dorsal ventral axis as well? Let's find out. We know that the dorsal and ventral sides of the embryo are first formed when the egg is fertilized and the cortical rotation occurs. 
Further down the line of development, a key part of dorsalization occurs when each side of the neural tube along the dorsal ventral axis gets specified with a roof plate and a foreplate, the former along the dorsal side and the latter along the ventral side. Johannes Holtfreder in the 1930s sought to understand exactly how the dorsalization of the neural tube occurred. He conducted a study where he saw, upon removing the notochord, the lack of formation of the floor plate. Then, when he added a second notochord somewhere else around the neural tube, a second floor plate formed. In both cases, however, neither did the roof plate not form, nor did the roof plate develop in a different spot. Thus, it can be concluded that at least for the floor plate, its formation is induced by some chemical signal by the notochord, and that the notochord does not have any direct connection with the formation of the roof plate. In fact, a chemical signal is indeed involved for the formation of both of these dorsalizing features. Sonic Hedgehog, or SHH, a protein emitted from the notochord, was found to create a floor plate and ventral markers on the neural tube when used alone. BMP, which was emitted by the ectoderm, created a similar effect in that it induced the formation of the roof plate and the neural crest along with dorsal markers. Given that both of these chemicals are transmitted, we know that there must be some sort of gradient that inv involved that creates such markers along the dorsal ventral axis of the neural tube. The effect of these gradients on the neural tube does not just form those markers and the plates, however. In fact, they cause the neural tube to develop segments of different types of neurons in the central nervous system that have a specific ordering along the dorsal ventral axis. For example, the MN section on the figure shown here is the section of the neural tube specifically housing motor neurons. This is all thanks to the chemical gradients and the specificity that they can produce. Like before, let's dive into whether or not similar factors are at play when developing the dorsal ventral positionings in invertebrates. The key to dorsalization is a protein called dorsal, which is floating around the cytoplasm of the oocyte. Dorsal begins the dorsalization process in the oocyte by entering the nucleus. However, it cannot even do so without it first being cleaved from a protein called cactus by another protein called toll. Only ventral cells in the, embry in the oocyte have the have the material necessary to induce toll's ability to cleave dorsal from cactus, and that is because they have a protein called pipe that initiates this downstream process. As a result of all this, dorsal gets cleaved exclusively on the ventral side of the oocyte, forming a gradient of the protein within the cytoplasm that helps to specify the fates of ventral developmental components. Today, class, we have learned multiple examples of how gradients are used in the formation of the dorsal ventral axis and anterior posterior axis, and the position of key components along them. Gradients are some of the most useful concepts that aid in the development of embryos, so I hope that you appreciate this wonderful piece of nature. Thank you so much, and have a great summer.